<laughs> okay. Well, are we actually live? Um, yeah. Oh, we are live. <laughs> Perfect. Oh, we're really live right now. I had to fix the sticks. Had to bring them back. The sticks are back. What do you guys think about the sticks? And I even b bought another globe since Dr. Shaw doesn't want to use his anymore. <laughs> It was the, the both decorations were a fail. So the yeah, computer's down here. We should have the computer like higher up. What do you think? Yeah. What's up, everyone? What's Welcome up? to our Good first to live chat. I've done a lot of lives on other platforms, you know, Instagram, TikTok. I go live on Clubhouse every week, but this is our first time going live on YouTube. So this should be really interesting. We're going to try to answer your Q&A. This is going to be... Um, free for all. So just ask whatever questions you want. We'll do our best to answer everything that we can to the best of our ability. So yeah, we can't bring it up higher without blocking. Oh, that's good. It, so. I like that. So here's, let's see here. We're going to find some questions, but I'll just give you a little intro to what's happening today in my life. So woke up today, uh, had surgeries all day in clinic rushed back to the clinic and we set up this live here. So I'm a little exhausted. I may have blood on my scrubs. We won't know. That's this is why I don't there. wear light blue scrubs and scrubs anymore. I actually don't buy them just for that reason. It, it's kind of weird, but if you get, I mean, we get blood on it. We do procedures, surgeries all day. So <laughs> today was a big surgery day. So I'm a little exhausted, a little frazzle dazzled. So I apologize for that. Um, but we have a huge announcement first before we answer any questions. So huge, huge announcement. Huge announcement. Okay. We have something here um, that came from YouTube the other day. And this is a exclusive premiere. We haven't shared this with anybody yet. No, we have not. Unless one of you shared it on your socials. Did not. Here. No, I waited for you to share it first because I'm just a nice guy like that. He's such a nice, he's got such a kind and <laughs> gentle soul. Um, but it's a letter from YouTube and they sent this to us and it says some 100,000 subscribers, just how far have you come? So, you know, basically congratulating us on hundred thousand subscribers and let's take that out. Yeah. And you know, we really do think a lot of that really thankful for that. And we're actually close to 300 probably will hit that today, but, but, um, it's still really, really nice and really yeah, so 100,000 subscribers. Like, I, I don't think when we started this channel, we ever thought that we would get here. And honestly, this like belongs to you guys for yeah. your support and like sharing this with your friends and your family and trusting us and writing comments and like watching our videos straight through. Like, <laughs> I mean, this belongs to you guys as much as it belongs to us. Like, uh, you know, seriously, we set out like on sort of a mission to educate people because uh, we thought there's a lot of misinformation out there and we just never realized what it would turn into on YouTube. And our channel has really taken off um, and we're just super happy to have an audience to share what we've learned with. So thank you guys all so much for this, honestly. Yeah, super appreciative, super humbling to be a part of something that's like, it's very special like this, so. I don't know if this is gonna stay up. If it falls, it falls. I don't think it's gonna stay up. <laughs> So thank you guys. Thank you. Um, this was one. I no, it's okay. Let's do it. <laughs> All right. So the question is, what goes first? Um, so this comes from uh, Raja Shri Barman. Um, which goes first, uh, snail mucin or alpha arbutin? So, okay, we've done like the the hacks videos. We like to just scroll through things and see what's trending. Snail mucin is one I found. And, you know, it's like, oh, this is ridiculous. It's it's snail mucin. I'm not going to go rub snail in my face. We have plenty of them here in North Carolina. But there is actually some data that it has some benefits. So I can't knock you for trying it, using it. It still is snail mucin. But I would actually put that on second, alpha arbutin on first, because the snail mucin is going to probably be something of an occlusive and preclude any other active from being as effective. So... So the general rule with like layering skincare products, first of all, there's no science behind this. So like we love to say that there was a bunch of studies that showed how to properly layer products, but they just don't exist. So basically what we do is just kind of use, um, I guess like what we think would happen. And that's basically layer the light, the thinnest ingredients to the thickest ingredients. So your serum, well, first you're like, you're gonna cleanse your face. 
then there's an airplane going on <laughs> over above head right now. But first you're gonna cleanse your face and then you're gonna use like a toner, an essence, something that's very lightweight, then your serums, then your thicker uh, lotions, then your creams, then your ointments. And so the thicker the ingredient is, the later it goes in your routine. So because alpha arbutin is usually a, bit, a little bit thinner than snail mucin is, it would, it would go uh, before snail mucin. Yeah, we actually started a video on layering um, we ran out of time. That happens a lot, actually. We kind of just run out of time because we both have other things going on. And eventually, we'll do a more formal uh, discussion on the topic. Let's see. I got one for you. OK. Monster Montage says, I've had serious psoriasis and was left with scarring resembling bruises all over my legs. Is there any type of remedy that can help my skin rebuild naturally? It's a tough question. So, you know, psoriasis um, usually doesn't leave like long-term scarring on the skin. So basically what needs to happen is you need to allow your skin to have time to repair itself. The legs get the worst circulation on the entire body. And so that just takes more time than anything else. So what ends up happening over time is that when your blood cells leak out into your skin, it releases a pigment called hemosiderin, and that hemosiderin can stain the skin, but it's only temporary. You just need to give it a lot of time. So my first, um, my first recommendation is first to get the psoriasis under control, because just like anything like acne, psoriasis, eczema, if you don't get those initial inflammatory processes under control, then you can't really treat the scarring or pigment that comes afterwards. And so first treat the psoriasis, then give it a little bit of time. Uh, I think that exfoliating um, in the shower with an exfoliating scrub on the legs and then using like something like amlactin that's gonna help turn sk those skin cells over may help with time, but first get the psoriasis under control with the dermatologist. Yeah, and kind of with that, like psoriasis is, there's a lot of misconceptions with it. I actually love psoriasis as a topic because there are some of the most effective and safest systemic treatments out of any condition, probably an autoimmune or immune related condition um, available for psoriasis. Like psoriasis medications have now set the bar that every other medication needs to live up to. And I'm hoping that one day they do. Um, so, you know, I think seeing a dermatologist for psoriasis, especially if it's like causing significant stress is imperative because we just have amazing things. Like the expectations have jumped exponentially in the last tech 10 years for both efficacy and safety. Um, but yeah, those topical scrubs may not treat the underlying problem. They might just help soften it up a little bit. So someone is asking, Grace Case is asking, what is the antidote to La Roche-Posay Tolarian double repair with SPF in my eyeball? How do I manage that? I do not know. So, so basically, um, first of all, that's a great sunscreen. Um, it is a chemical-based sunscreen. And um, just so you know, a lot of people always ask, is, is, sunscreens with moisturizers enough protection. As long as the SPF level is 30, then you can use a moisturizing sunscreen. And that's gonna double as a step. So I love that because you can skip your moisturizer and just use your moisturizing sunscreen. Uh, the caveat though, is that you still need to use that two finger lengths of sunscreen to get adequate protection. So maybe a little bit more moisturizer than you would normally use, but you're st it's still gonna work. Now, if it gets in your eyes, any chemical sunscreen is pretty much gonna burn the eyes. And so if you're somebody who gets your sunscreen in your eyes, I recommend using more of a mineral-based sunscreen that has zinc oxide that doesn't burn the eyes as much. 100% agree. My main pet peeve with sunscreen, other than I can feel it on my face, is that it burns my eyes. Cause I'm always, I usually personally wear it when I'm most active. Um, but funny story. So today, this morning when I was with, uh, or just getting ready. So I'm using, Did you say that you don't wear sunscreen every day. Uh, I actually do not wear sunscreen when I go to work. I'm just outing myself here and I don't wear it when I'm inside all day. One, because I go to work when it's dark out Two, we don't have windows in the office. The visible light from stuff can make disfigmentation worth worse, but I'm willing to take that gamble. <laughs> I love the honesty. So, you know, I think that, um, oftentimes this is viewfinder inactive. What does that mean? Uh, still looks um, good. So I think oftentimes, like, you know, in dermatology, we set sort of unrealistic expectations for people. And I think when you set unrealistic expectations, then they end up people, including myself, like, you know, if you tell me, like, you got to eat well, and you got to diet, and you have to, you know, exercise every single day, like, if you set so many goals, it's so hard to, like, meet any of them. And I think with sunscreen, I think in dermatology, we often set unrealistic expectations for people where we say, you gotta apply sunscreen every single day, whether you're inside or you're outside, you have to reapply every two hours or it's not as effective. And I think what ends up happening is people say, well, I'm just not gonna wear sunscreen at all, period, because it's this goal that's just unattainable for me in my current lifestyle. And so for me, I think that 
if you're wearing sunscreen, sometimes it's better than no times. I think if you're using sunscreen once a day, it's better than not using it at all in a day. And so I think you just need to set realistic goals, even though the recommendation is to use it every day and reapply every two hours, as long as you're applying it at least once a day, that is sort of what I do. And definitely between the hours of 10 and three when you're outside, that's when it's super harsh. Um, okay. Anyway, the actual story was I was so Ulta MD. I've been using trying. I'm just like I'm, I think I'm about to transition into an eye cream kick and actually see what ones actually have any results. So I was using this Ulta MD eye cream and I, I was just distracted and I literally just put it straight into my eye, missed everywhere around the eye. So I, I had the same question this morning, like any problems with this <laughs> ingredient in my eye? It turned out fine. It's fine. You just flush the eye with some water, just normal water, and you should be fine. Yeah. Um, all right. See what we got. That that might actually be a value. Mm. Let's see. Hmm. So uh, Maria said, "I Maria Goncalves." Like a, a letter not in the Phoenician oh, alphabet, so I'm not it. sure. It says, I use EpiDuo. It works, but I still get breakouts. Should I incorporate azelaic acid, Phoenicia, uh, skin, 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 15%. So, so the question is, someone's on EpiDuo. So what is EpiDuo? EpiDuo is a combination of adapalene, which is like Differin um, at a higher percentage, and benzoyl peroxide. So both of those ingredients, if you watch our acne video, um, are both, those are both a level A, a grade one, grade A level one <laughs> ingredients uh, in the treatment of acne. So tremendous ingredients, very, very effective. I love prescribing Epiduo. The only holdback on Epiduo is that it's really expensive for people if it's not covered by insurance. Um, so you can actually do like an Epiduo hack at home and then just buy Differin and Panoxyl or Differin and Adapalene from La roche -Posay. I mean, Differin and uh, benzoyl peroxide from La Roche-Posay, and you're gonna have almost a similar effect. It's not gonna be as strong, but it's gonna be close. Yeah. Um, okay, so that's, that's what EpiDuo <laughs> is. Um, so if, if, if it's not working for you, uh, of course talk to your dermatologist who prescribed you the EpiDuo because they may wanna add in something else. Um, they may need to add in something oral that's gonna be more effective than the topical medications. But as like acid is safe to sort of add to that routine, what I would do is use the EpiDuo at night and I would use the azelaic acid in the morning. And I think that that's a very reasonable routine um, to add azelaic acid to. Yeah, completely agree. This is kind of in that same video, you can kind of just pick and choose, honestly, from some of the either the grade B or level, two, what do we call them, tier two, the tier two ingredients and plug them in. That's why uh, with a lot of things acne included, there's some trial and error. Not everybody's skin responds the same to everything. So azelaic acid, great combination. Um, you can also kind of just pick from those tier lists that we described and see what works for you. Which one? So Lo oh, Alrunez, oh. L O E W, <laughs> said, Can I pop my white pimples? Um, that's a good question. So, whiteheads, basically, when they've come to the surface of the skin, that is honestly the best time to pop a pimple because once they're like those deep red pimples, not a good idea. I am against popping because I sometimes will pop pimples once they come to the surface, but they always take longer to heal when you do that. They always leave a little bit of a scar that takes like the redness or the pigment takes time to heal. So there are better options to spot treat. I know Dr. Maxfield's not like a big spot. I'm treater. really not, but and let me tell you why though, just briefly. So I 100% agree with everything said, leave those freaking red ones alone. That is the most common reason they scar and get worse. Um, but the reason I don't like spot treating is because I think what I see in the real world, just with patients and stuff, is that people tend to just spot treat. Like they'll even use the active ingredients that are best to prevent them, and they'll use them as spot treatments. And it just it fails people every time if you're only spot treating. Yeah. So I think that if you have if you do have acne and you're getting acne breakouts, you should add something that is an anti-acne ingredient. So you can add a retinoid, you can add benzoyl peroxide, you can add azelaic acid, but use it on your whole face. And then when you do have your breakouts, you can then spot treat on top of your full acne routine. So it's not a solution to like someone who has constant outbreaks, but it is a good to spot treat if you do have a breakout. So I do like benzoyl peroxide as a spot treatment. 
I do like those hydrocolloid patches. He a really lot. does. I really he like them. I really use them, them myself. I think that hydrocolloid is really good at healing the skin. Um, it keeps you from picking at them. So if you get like the Mighty Patch or Peace Out has one or Zit Sika has one, um, I like Peace Out and I like the Mighty Patches the most of the ones that I've tried personally. They stay on the best. They blend well with the skin, <laughs> and um, I, I think that they heal my skin pretty well. So if I have a white head, I try to resist the urge of putting my hands on it, and I just basically put it as a spot treatment. I leave it on overnight, and usually that goop uh, gets sucked out of the pimple, and I don't pick at it, and it heals pretty well. Yeah, but I, I agree with the question asker. You know, you, you really don't want to walk around with a white head on your day, or uh, walk around with a white head on your face all day. It's just super noticeable. Just do something. <laughs> No, that's just a compliment. We're not going to read this compliment to you. I just wanted him to read a compliment about me out loud. So just I was setting him up for failure there. Gosh, no. I don't know. So wait, there was a question there too. Just, so the same concept though. Do you apply sunscreen on the morning walks? I would actually if the sun is out because the walk is going to probably take a little while. I run, honestly, I run in the morning when it's dark out. And so obviously I don't apply sunscreen. Um, I do actually put it on sometimes. That's one of the ways I test my active sunscreens is I'll just... Um, run, then work out and go surfing. I'll see if it stays on my face, but not if it's not sunny. Do you want to answer this? <laughs> Which one? This From one? Alp Tansug. Uh, sure. Um, so eye creams, are they necessary? And the reason I hesitate on that, you know, I really am going to dig into this thoroughly and I'm like just starting that process. The, the only reason you might need a dedicated eye cream itself is it just might have some ingredients that are more sensitive, more more well tolerated for that sensitive skin of the eye. But I think that's the only real caveat. Like most things that you get are going to be safe for the eye, most of them. And sometimes the active ingredients that you use elsewhere on your face, you're gonna to be too irritating for that super thin skin uh, like Dr. Cha has. So I have a differing opinion on this. And, and that's because I do have sensitive eyelids. But I think some people have different skin concerns within their eyelids, right? So some people have dark circles they want to target. They have bags that they want to target. They have fine lines around their eyes, but they don't have lines elsewhere. And so they want to target those. I think it's appropriate to have an eye cream. Eye creams are tested for the eye area. So um, they are often they don't sting the eye if you get it in there. Um, also, they are they you know usually target a specific issue around the eye. So they'll have lightening ingredients like niacinamide. They may have brightening ingredients, alpha arbutin, vitamin C, things that are going to help with dark circles. Um, they may help with puffiness, like the caffeine eye cream from the Inky list. So I think that it really just sort of targets things that may be specific to the under eyes. And I do think that the under eye skin is different. So let me ask you this, right? You're not going to ask what's when, the thinnest skin in the body. <laughs> no, I know. We know what the thinnest skin on the body is. But let me ask you this, right? So we look at so we do a lot of surgery where we uh, where we are, right? And mm -hmm. we look at skin underneath the microscope all the time. And when we look at skin under the microscope, can you tell the difference between eyelid skin and like the nose? 100%. Okay, so a lot of people will tell you that the eyelid skin is no different than the rest of the body. But for us who look at the skin under the microscope all the time, the eyelid skin is very different. It has less oil glands. It's extremely thin compared to other parts of the body. So I do think you should treat it a little bit differently. That being said, if you have a good moisturizer and you're not trying to target anything like dark circles, fine lines, uh, bags underneath the eyes, then your regular moisturizer is going to do perfectly well for under your eyes. But if you have a specific issue or you have very sensitive eyelids like me, then you may like eye creams like I do. Okay. Well, there, here's the caveat there. So like, that's kind of what I said just differently in that like the ingredients are largely the same with the exception of maybe something like mm -hmm. caffeine. Um, you can use a lot of the ingredients you're going to be using to treat dispigmentation or even collagen growth. It's the same ingredient just in the eyes, and they do formulate it in a way that's been tested and safe. But if you're just looking ingredient to ingredient, you're going to see a tremendous amount of overlap. Agreed, especially for just like your regular moisturizing eye creams. Yeah. Whoa, wait, what? No, he has not been working out. <laughs> I'm going to tell you, uh, Har uh, Harshali Patel, um, I have never worked out a day in my life, uh, what is sadly. That? Well, that's he not does. true. He okay, does. I haven't worked out. I haven't worked out since we went to the gym. Oh, yeah. In um, Greensboro. How long ago was that? Two that was years. like almost two years ago now. 
I used to be like in really good shape before med school. I mean, I don't know if like, it was like really, it's not like Dr. Maxfield shape. I was never like in that shape, but I was in decent shape. Um, and then med school was like literally just like a downhill slide. Um, Cause I just like focused on other things and neglected myself a lot of times. Which is um, common. So, you know, I think that I was just talking the other day about this. Like when you have like a million things to do, like you end up prioritizing things and oftentimes when you run out of space you end up taking away from like yourself because it's the only thing that you can like take away from without like affecting somebody else and so like with all the stuff like between the job and um between you know social media and between my family life like um i mostly just sacrifice my own health for you know to do all this stuff so not good yeah and i sacrificed sleep in in the beginning of med school med school before i even got in i was like okay i'm gonna continue working out no matter what the cost i remember after a surgery rotation i had been in the hospital for um an unquantifiable amount of hours because i think there's actually a legal limit and it was like definitely 28 hours plus and um 24 hours 28 hours plus and it like i was at the gym working out with my eyes closed um so yeah you just have to prioritize and for me it was just something i made stick he, he, he makes it like he works at, well, you work six, six days a week or five yeah, days? Yeah, something like that, five and six days a week. Yeah, he's like very committed um, to it. And I think you do have to pick up the habit. It's, it's worthwhile, I think. It's probably more important than your skin, taking care of your body. <laughs> that might actually be true. Uh, I'm, sure, I'm sure that that's true. Heart health, yeah. So I have, a, so, I have another question here. Uh, what do you got, Pat? Um, <clears throat> Salvador Romero says, I'm in high school and thinking of going into dermatology as a career. How long did it take you to get where you are and how old are you both now? Okay. So a lot of questions built into one. I actually love this question. So actually before we even got on social media, this is, we were like in the mentoring space and we were in the education space. So we were like sort of behind the scenes teaching medical students and trying to like help people through this process and then transition to kind of speaking more to you guys and to the public about skin conditions. But we primarily come from the education and mentoring space. And so I love answering questions like this because this is everything we did before getting on social media pretty much. Yeah, which was a huge part of our lives. And, you know, coming from your age group, we both sucked. We were horrible students. And we kind of had transformative paths around the same, like we had very similar stories. So, um, you know, no matter where you're at in high school, you can set yourself up uh, for whatever future I believe that you would want. It may take a long time and a lot of work. Yeah. So like, don't, don't like expect that you have to like get it right a hundred percent of the time. You don't need to be like an A student in high school to be able to get to where we are today. It's just that at some point you have to decide like how serious you are about your career path. And you may discover later, I, I at 21 decided that I was going to go to med school and started to take my pre-med requisites at yeah, that time. And so, you know, we both started a little bit later and we're here. So it's just a little bit of an elongated path. I uh, wish it wasn't that way, but it's part of like the learning process and it makes you who you are. It's part of your story. And then you bring those values that you learned along the way um, to your career. So there's like never really wasted time. Um, but I think yeah. that you don't need to get it right 100% of the time, all the time. But to get to this point, if you went straight through, you would do four years of undergrad, four years of med school, four years of dermatology residency. And along the way, you would take a lot of exams. And that's how you become a dermatologist in the United States. So it's about 12 years after high school. Yeah. Yeah. And then we both, uh, unfortunately, added some extra years along the way, too, because we just loved everything about medicine. Like, that's why we wrote questions and built curriculums for all the medical specialties. Just uh, we just love all of medicine. And then we eventually settled into dermatology, which is probably the best. I think we both think it's the best. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it may be not the best for you, but for us, for I us. mean, it's... I mean, we get to improve the quality of people's lives. Um, We really have really interesting things that we do every single day. We do a lot of surgery. We do a lot of things with our hands. Um, So I think that for me, it's the best and most fulfilling job that I've had, but it wouldn't be for everybody, I guess. Let's do this one. I think that's a really important one. So someone asked about, should I worry about hydroadenitis superativa and how do we get rid of them? So... The reason I think this is important is because it's something that takes a long time to get diagnosed because it starts out with little boils and bumps, usually in the armpit or the groin. Um, and that can be happening to normal people, uh, but it's recurrent and chronic and leads to permanent and deformative scarring or deforming scars in some in the people with HS or some of them, hydro, hydradenitis separativa. So how important is it? Um, 
if you've been diagnosed with it, I think you should consistently see a dermatologist to prevent the scarring. Just like acne, the most important thing you can do is prevent scarring because that affects the rest of your life. With HS, same thing. The most important thing you can do is try to prevent scarring. A dermatologist is going to be paramount in helping you prevent that um, because that affects the rest of your life. Right. And so a lot of people don't know this, but HS is a condition or hydroadenitis is a condition that we treat in dermatology. Sadly, a lot of people in other medical specialties are not aware of hydroadenitis because the research on it that's been evolving has changed so rapidly over the last few years. And so oftentimes people go to the ER and they have like a pimple in their arm or they have a boil in their arm and the emergency room doctor drains it and then sends them on their way. And they just continuously have this happening where they end up developing scarring long term. So it's super important. They first get the diagnosis of hydroadenitis superativa find a dermatologist that treats it. And then we have a lot of different treatments. I think over the counter, one of the best options that you have is actually panoxyl or benzoyl peroxide washes. Benzoyl peroxide washes are very effective, at least for the initial stages of HS. And so is Hibiclens or chlorhexidine um, as wipes or washes underneath the armpits and in the groins and in other areas where you develop these uh, bumps and boils of hydroadenitis superativa. So it has nothing to do with cleanliness. It has nothing to do with something you're doing wrong. It's an inflammatory disease yeah. of the hair follicle. And we treat it in dermatology and it breaks my heart when people don't seek treatment for this and like are embarrassed about it and don't want yeah. to share it with people because we treat it and we've had a lot of success treating it and it can really improve the quality of your life if, if you seek out treatment. Yeah, absolutely. We're getting a lot of these ones. Um, about acne scars? Yeah. Yeah. So acne scars. So first, uh, I think acne scars is such a broad term that we need to kind of look at what kind of acne scars do we have. So there are two that are not like technically scars, but they are, they are perceived as scars. So one is post-inflammatory erythema or PIE. Second is post-inflammatory hyperpigmentation or PIH. And then the other ones are the more like deep scooped out scars that actually cause like a divot in the skin um, where you actually see surface change um, with the skin. And we call those atrophic acne scars. And they can either be um, ice pick, they can be rolling, they can be box car. But either way, you're going to kind of treat them the same way. And so we just need to put your acne scars into one of those three categories. Yeah. So the redness and the, so I guess the first thing I'll say is you have to treat the acne. As long as the acne is untreated, these whether red or the dark or true scars, none of them are going to get better or stop coming. So acne treated. Now we move on to treating these. The redness and dark spots, those will fade with time. For the dark ones, you can treat it with things uh, that would normally treat hyperpigmentation like azelaic acid. Um, and then for the true scars, there's like a there, there's actually a pretty long list of things. Uh, unfortunately, a lot of things over the counter, some of them are not as effective as others, but they would start with something that's collagen building like a retinol. You could you know theorize vitamin C, maybe niacinamide. Um, and then you step into like procedural things as well. Right. So it depends on the type, the treatment. Um, for all of them, continuing your retinoid is going to be very effective. And so if you're already taking like a tretinoin or a dapoline or using a retinol, you can use that to treat your acne, your post-inflammatory erythema, your post-inflammatory hyperpigmentation, and those atrophic acne scars. For the atrophic acne scars, over the counter, there really is very limited things that you can do for it. I do like the peeling solutions for this because Good they're a little bit stronger alpha hydroxy acids that do help with um, the, the scars a long term. So I would say something like the ordinary peeling solution or the Paulist Choice 25%, uh, 2% uh, BHA solution is going to be one of the best things you can do over the counter. And then after that, like you said, procedures at a dermatologist's office. So Which, something like microneedling, yeah, include microneedling, chemical peels, and laser resurfacing procedures. And I will tell you, like you said, like get the acne treated because it is so much harder for us to treat acne scars than it is for us to treat acne. Acne is super easy for us to treat. We can obliterate it. We have so many different options for it. For acne scars, it is a very, very, very long and uh, laborious process on both of our parts to try to get you improvement. Yeah, and unfortunately, like kind of alluding to, it really it does, uh, the topicals are very, very much less effective than the procedures, especially when you get to like the laser resurfacing and things like that. So, you know, unfortunately, it, it is more involved to get highly effective, uh, noticeable results very quickly. No, not yet. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so what we just read was uh, Leanne Wilder, Leanne Wilder, 
Thank you for your question. Asked about ingestible collagen. Yay or nay? Oh, is it better for the skin? Do you have any thoughts on this? I have a million thoughts on this. Um, I hate. I'm so hesitant to talk about these things because this falls into something similar to like plexus almost for me, where it's this new. It's a form of like oral supplementation with some incredible uh, promises. Um, and so, you know, looking into this a little bit, I'm going to continue digging in this probably for a period of months and then just come up with a huge consolidated uh, answer. But I think it's probably as effective as eating normal proteins and amino acids, just by the way that these are broken down. So oral collagen supplements probably are broken down into normal amino acids, which are the building bro blocks for proteins and collagens. And so your body may not be absorbing it like just pure raw collagen, because there are a lot of different types of collagen and your body's probably gonna absorb it as the normal building blocks that you would normally get from your diet. Right. That's probably all that needs to be said, honestly. <laughs> but it's so just they've done studies. So they've done studies. Uh, most of the studies are done by the manufacturers of the collagen, um, and they show that liquid collagen may be more beneficial. I agree with Dr. Maxfield on this. I'm just like thinking logically, right? Like from how we know that collagen is produced. So how is collagen produced in our skin? We have a little cell that sits in our dermis layer of the skin and it produces collagen. And that little cell is producing collagen in a very intricate way. It's weaving glycine amino acids with other amino acids to try to make this perfect blend of collagen. So, so for, for me, like theoretically for collagen orally to get through your gut unprocessed, and then find its way, float its way up to your dermis and just lay itself perfectly the way that your fibroblast is laying down collagen. I just don't see it happening that way. And so what I imagine is that people are seeing improvement because they have diets that are deficient in amino acids and those diets that are deficient in amino acids are supplemented by this collagen supplement that has those amino acids you need to build collagen and then it really helps those people. Exactly, because the only way it would work is the assumption that you're gonna have some sort of collagen deficient diet, which collagen is a present in probably most products, including on animal products. So maybe vegans uh, would be deficient in some of it, but uh, just the same, totally agree with that. Yeah, so I, I think more studies need to be done, but my intuition tells me that it's not a miracle. I'm noticing that my hair is getting more and more messed up as we're doing this. I have a tendency to do that. And in all, my, in all of our videos, I'm like trying to pay like attention. Progressively gets worse. Yeah, progressively I was like worse. all day, like wearing masks, wearing goggles and stuff. So like I'm, I'm a mess right now from surgeries today. Let's see. I'm like super uncomfortable right now for some reason. It's, it's kind of warm. Right here. It, it's a little bit warm. Like can we do some AC? Yes. Uh, no, no, don't do the fan. The fan like gets like... Uh, well, the AC's on, it's just the room, you know. Oh. oh. Oh, wait. Ah, I saw one, I saw one. This one. Oh, that's an interesting thought. Hmm. Ooh, so Stephen Doe asked about minoxidil on the face to encourage scruff. How do I layer use with other skincare actives? So let's answer part one first. So minoxidil or Rogaine for hair growth on the face. So can Rogaine be used to grow facial hair? Abs yes, I'll say it. I'm not sure if it's honestly studied, but one of the adverse events when you use it on the scalp is you get hair growth in areas that it drips down. So only logically it would help. Yeah, so uh, I do believe there was a study. Um, I have to check again to see if the study's been done, but it works. Uh, that I'm sure of. I, like just like Rogaine for like some people with hair loss it doesn't work for everybody. Yeah. But it does work for a lot of people. Um, it is gonna if you stop using it, you're gonna lose those benefits. So just like Rogaine for the scalp, um, it's gonna have like it's, for a few months after you stop using it, you'll have those benefits, but eventually um, that will stop because it prolongs the growth phase of your hair cycle. And eventually if you stop using it, it's gonna switch your hairs back into telogen. So I have seen people use it with actually some benefit, to be honest. Yeah. How would you layer it? It's kind of rude that he would drink while I'm fasting. Don't you guys think? <laughs> um, you go. I got one for you. Fasting. <laughs> <laughs> uh, what was the question? Um, how, I think you're how do you layer it? it? Um, I would just put it on first, you know, because it uh, the way that Rogaine works is that it, it basically is like very thin and it dries on your skin. So treat it like almost like an essence in the sense that 
you're going to cleanse the skin, you're going to apply it, and then you're going to put your, uh, your other actives over it. And then hopefully the goal is that your beard gets so thick that you won't be able to apply your other actives over it. So it, it, is, it is pretty effective, and I've seen a lot of people have success with it. Yeah, and there's this interesting thing on social with that. There's a so it's the headline is something like minoxidil rare side effect, and it's with this super super jacked guy who talks about it. If you see this case report um, of this patient who has like this significant growths all over him, or he's just grown up in general, it's it's probably not reliable. It's a single case. He was taking it orally, which is probably also safe in that way. So just probably disregard that case report if you ever see it. Someone was asking you about liquid chlorophyll. So they're asking mm -hmm. you specifically. That's good. I watched your TikTok on it. <laughs> <laughs> so I think he has the same opinion as I me. do, actually, completely. Um, Dr. Duran says that fluorescent light emits UV rays and blue light from devices can cause aging and worsen skin conditions. Indoors at night. So that's fair. We can, I mean, that's the same topic. Yeah, that's fair. So Big Shoals Energy said, do you suggest people wear sunscreen indoors at night? And then said, Dr. Dre, another YouTube derm, says that fluorescent lights and UV rays and blue light from devices can cause aging or worsen skin conditions. I mean, first off, Dr. Dre is one of the original gangsters of the social oh, media gee. space. She, I have She's a great. tremendous amount of respect for her and her content. Like she makes really good and reliable content. So yes. if you're looking for somebody um, that's not us, you maybe you don't like us. Yeah. Um, she makes really good and reliable content. So um, you know, definitely worthwhile checking her videos out. Um, I would say most of the, like for everything I've ever seen, you know, I, I don't disagree with things that she says. I don't know exactly what she said on this topic exactly. Um, but the way that I stand on this is, do you need to wear a sunscreen at night? Uh, no. Um, I think that if you're, you know, the amount of skin damage that's happening from the lights in your house um, is, we don't know is basically the answer. The question is, does the blue light from your screens and your devices actually cause hyperpigmentation or aging? Well, we know that blue light does cause hyperpigmentation, especially in people that are prone to hyperpigmentation, but we don't know if our screens emit enough blue light to actually cause this. And there's no studies to show that it actually does. Yeah. We do know that UV, that, that the sun produces enough blue light to cause hyperpigmentation. And so definitely, I think that if you're inside and you have big windows in your house, you have like, you know, huge bay windows in your house and you're getting a ton of sunlight inside your house. UVA rays are going to penetrate your window glass. Visible light is definitely going to penetrate your window glass and can make aging worse and can make hyperpigmentation worse. Um, but otherwise, I would say that for your devices, I think it's up in the air. I think that if you worry about your devices causing aging and hyperpigmentation, I think you're going to worry yourself sick. Probably. That's a good point, actually. Um, so I, I wouldn't like kill yourself over it. I think it's a legitimate concern. I think we need more data on it, but I wouldn't be rushing to force everyone to wear, uh, you know, sunscreen while they're looking at their computers at night. And I wouldn't wear sunscreen at night. I do think that some sunscreens can be pretty occlusive. Right. And I think that you do need to cleanse your skin and have some of these occlusive things off of your skin for at least part of the day. Which is actually a big thing. I, I would have guessed that Dr. Shaw wore sunscreen at night. <laughs> He just, he really does wear it all the time. For me, this is like, again, going to using it deliberately. Like for me, it's like a measured thing. I, I know the benefits, the risks. I know what I'm trying to treat. Like you have tan lines right now. Probably not. I'm wearing a wetsuit still all the time. Um, I think I saw a tan line. No, maybe. <laughs> I don't know how that's possible. <laughs> uh, but anyway. Oh, one thing blue light does do, though, for sure, is sleep mess up your sleep, uh, your circadian rhythm. It breaks down your body's natural produced melatonin. So um, that's why screen time at night before you go to bed is actually a bad idea. It, it, that's the one, I think, established fact about blue light. And I suck at sleeping. I'm a horrible sleeper. Just a fun tidbit. There's so many questions. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so... Jung Cook um, BB said, "Can vitamin supplements be causing my acne?" Yeah, and uh, we did. I think we did call this out in the acne tiered list. So, vitamin B12 is the one that has some evidence to suggest that it does. 
Yeah, so there is some studies that show that B12 supplements um, can cause acne in some people. I think if you're B12 deficiency and you need you need your uh, B12, then of course you have to continue taking that supplement and maybe yes. your skin will suffer as a result. I think most people that are taking B12 supplements don't actually need them. And so if you're taking supplements unnecessarily, I think they can sometimes cause more harm than good. It is a water soluble vitamin. so. A lot of times any water water soluble vitamin, you're just gonna urinate out any extra. So that's why they say that in 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 the US we have like very expensive urine because we, <laughs> we sure urine, take a lot of vitamin supplements that we probably don't need. Um, some people say that like vitamin, uh, like biotin and B7 can cause acne as well because it helps to kind of uh, with like keratin growth and stuff like that. Um, I think, I don't haven't seen a study on it. It makes sense logically why it could potentially make acne worse. Should you be taking biotin supplements? That's where I was going to go next. That's why I like lit up when he started talking because biotin is super interesting. One for, does it help the skin? Does it help the hair? Does it help the nails? And if you're biotin deficient, of course. Um, in general, I'm going to go out and say probably not um, for any of those things. But uh, also we're learning more and more about people who supplement large amounts of biotin and outside of dermatology, it actually has some effects on like laboratory testing, um, so it, it's not entirely inert, although you will pee it out. Right. Like he was saying, um, they, they did show maybe some benefits with nails for biotin hair growth. There has been like no substantiated evidence that taking biotin supplements, unless you're biotin deficient. Right. And the reason why this idea that taking biotin would be helpful for hair growth is because we know that people that have biotin deficiency, that truly have biotin deficiency do develop alopecia or hair loss. And so we figure, okay, well, if you develop hair loss from being biotin deficient, maybe if we supplement it and everyone, it will be helpful. But yeah. all the studies have not really shown any substantive evidence that taking biotin supplements are helpful. And like you was saying, the lab tests being thrown off, this actually became really important. The FDA issued a warning saying that, um, that if you're taking biotin supplements to tell your doctor, because it can actually bind one of the uh, components of some of the tests that we do for your labs. So some people were having like heart attacks and then they were getting lab work done that was showing that the lab work was normal, even though they were having a heart attack. And the reason why was that the biotin supplement was throwing off their lab work. This can happen with pregnancy tests. This can happen with thyroid tests. Yeah. And so just be aware that um, at least tell your doctor I'm taking a biotin supplement. I don't think it's something that you should like completely avoid as a result of that, but just be aware that it has some wonky evidence uh, supporting it and that you probably don't need it. Okay, so I'm gonna throw on my like doctor glasses for a moment. Um, I don't wear glasses, but when I'm doing procedures and surgery, sometimes I do. Let's just talk about what happens with vitamin deficiencies. So the reason we know biotin has a role in the hair and the nails is because when you don't take it, <laughs> people's what hair and nails- these glasses? Please support our channel so that Dr. <laughs> Maxwell can outgrow his sixth grade glasses. <laughs> they don't fit his face, I keep Well, these are them. actually my new ones, so. Oh, they are? They're from Walgreens, they were $20. <laughs> are they like <laughs> stepping up in the world? They... Yeah, these are two X readers. Uh, anyway. No, they're not prescription then. Oh, then no, they're not prescription. So yeah. the bi we know that people who are deficient in biotin have a problem with their skin, uh, their hair, they get alopecia. We know that people who are zinc deficient have developed eczematous eruptions and rashes around the face. Interesting thing about vitamin C is that vitamin C deficient people don't have a huge effect on their immune system. And why do I care at all about that? Is because of the vitamin C supplements sold for the common cold. I take them when I get the cold. I just wanna feel like I'm doing something. But this has been around for almost a century, never been substantiated. Yeah, I'm not going to get involved in the vitamin C. Like this is like a like a hot topic. Like people, is it? people will like I'm just go saying, to war over. I told you, I C take it when I have a cold. But I'm just saying, a person who is vitamin C deficient and has scurvy does not have significant immune system functions. Unlike zinc, where if you're deficient in zinc, your immune system suffers tremendously. Vitamin C scurvy. What does that look like? Uh, vitamin C and scurvy. Well, let's tell you. Let's so you get corkscrew hairs, which means your hairs kind of twirl up. You get perifollicular uh, purpur or petechia, which is where the red, red blood cells leak out of the little vessels, or especially around the hair follicles. Um, your teeth can fall out, and your gums bleed. Um, and then there's some more things like some joint bone things. But the reason is collagen. Is, uh, vitamin C is foundational in the growth of collagen. Right. It's the most important building block for for collagen. So I'm done with these. No, you were doing a good job. Why does that was the one I, I like uh, uh, when nerd mode, I think we appreciate that. Um, 
Can, let's see. What are your thoughts on black seed oil? Uh, we'll have to look into black seed oil a little bit more. I'm glad you said that because I was thinking the same thing, honestly. We'll have to look into it a little bit more. I will tell you what oils I do like mm -hmm. um, for certain things. So black seed oil just isn't one of the ones that comes up to me. So I'll just have to do a little bit more research on it. Um, but what do you like for skin oils? As for, okay, for skin, and I, I love oils too now, but like anything but the face, coconut oil is tremendous. Um, the jojoba oil overall is very good and balanced. Um, those are probably my two favorites right now. Safflower oil is very high in linoleic acid, very beneficial for moisturizing. Sunflower oil tends to do pretty well. Those are probably like strong four for me. Yeah, I, I like argan oil as yeah, well. Um, I think that's a good one. I think for the hair, I, I do like coconut oil, but if it gets on the scalp or on the face or on the back, it can cause acne in some people. I don't like olive oil. Um, I think olive oil um, tends to grow yeast and it's actually pretty bad for your skin barrier. So consensus. Um, I think that that's uh, agreed upon by everybody. Um, for hair growth, natural things, rosemary oil, peppermint oil seem to have some benefit. And then taking oral pumpkin seed oil seems to have some benefit. So if we're talking about oils for hair growth, That's those good. seem to be the ones that have some scientific evidence behind them. A lot of people will swear by castor oil. Unfortunately, there's been like no studies on castor oil for hair growth, but like you'll swear you talk to like a thousand people and I'll tell you <laughs> that castor oil made their hair grow. So it's just another one of those things that's to say it doesn't work. I don't know. Been around for a hundred years probably. So one day I'll do a study on it. We'll find out. Best antioxidant besides vitamin C. Mm. It's an interesting statement altogether, actually. So I, everything's an antioxidant. Like well, I feel like. So the, the question was just in case I don't think you hear Pat. Um, oh. So our, our editor, um, he's behind it with us here and mediating all of the traffic. Anyway, the question was, what's the best antioxidant other than vitamin C? Okay. Uh, what do you think? Oh well, okay. So really, vitamin E, and I, I don't like vitamin E because it's overhyped for the wrong things. But it's an excellent stabilizer and a very strong antioxidant if specifically combined with vitamin C and ferulic acid or just vitamin C. So I would actually say that's a pretty, pretty dynamic combination, vitamin E and vitamin C. Antioxidants in my mind are a dime a dozen though, because almost any plant-based product is going to have that. Anything can be called like an antioxidant. Even this chlorophyll thing, you know, is an antioxidant. Yeah. So there's so many different things that are antioxidants. How many of the antioxidants actually have benefit for the skin? I mean, who knows? I mean, people say astaxanthin, um, has like 6,000 times the amount of antioxidant capabilities as vitamin C. So I think vitamin C is probably number one. Um, I think it's probably the most potent antioxidant. Um, I think niacinamide has some antioxidant benefits, but if we're talking about antioxidants that actually truly have benefit in skincare, I think that's a pretty limited number of things, but everything is an antioxidant. Like, yeah. you know, you can find antioxidant properties for anything. It's true. And so let me tell you guys something that I see come up a lot, especially on some certain websites that promote health information. Um, They'll say that these antioxidant things are like they'll prevent cancer, they'll prevent, they'll help with collagen protection, collagen growth. And they always just theorize that by protecting you from free radical damage, it's going to help protect you from everything associated with inflammation ever. And this is potentially partly true, but I think it's a huge extrapolation. That's like they're taking like a little bit here and making gigantic claims. And again, we have antioxidants available in a numerous amount of products. So using this one ingredient like vitamin E or vitamin C for its antioxidant prop properties is not going to just treat and help everything that suffers from oxidative stress. Yeah. Just a personal thing that I, I get frustrated with. Oh, that one? Yeah. Okay. So Trollo Lucifer. Trollo? No. Oh, well, yeah, I guess so. Rollo Lucifer said, uh, what would you recommend for hormonal acne? So I know Dr. Shaw's thought on this. Um, in general, hormonal acne is treated the same as acne because all acne has some hormonal component to it. Am I wrong? That's where I stand. <laughs> I, I want to <laughs> see everyone, like, you know. It does. You know, it does. But I think the one caveat there is, though, I think, that uh, women and specifically in their 20s and 30s disproportionately will suffer from hormonal acne, especially present along the jawline. And with them, we'll use certain things that might not be tolerated as well in men. Right. So I, I think the difference comes when you see a dermatologist, but I think over the counter, yeah. treatments are pretty much going to be the same. I think 
lifestyle changes probably go a little bit further in hormonal acne than they do in other forms of acne, like diet exercise probably do even better in hormonal acne. It's a great thought. Yeah. Um, just because there is a correlation with PCOS or polycystic ovarian syndrome and that overlap between hormonal acne and polycystic ovarian syndrome. We know that polycystic ovarian syndrome does pretty well with lifestyle changes, um, even though it's not 100%. I think over the counter though, the foundations of acne treatment are exactly the same, whether it's hormonal, whether it's teenage acne, the difference comes into play. Like you were saying, um, when you go to see a dermatologist and we start to use oral medications or other topical medications that truly target that hormonal component, but over the counter, you don't really have access to those things, unfortunately. Right. And you yeah, know, and, and unfortunately this is one of those instances where it does kind of make sense because yeah, you're really deliberately trying to target and manipulate some of the minor things about a person's hormone levels. And so it is, it, I think it makes sense to try to see a dermatologist here. If you're really suffering from it and the over the counter options aren't working, you're probably not missing a magic bullet over the counter. If you're using everything that you would use for normal acne, it's not working. I think you should probably see someone at that point. Agreed. So there's something really exciting coming out for hormonal acne though. Oh yeah. Prescription wise. This is probably good. worth talking about. There's a, there's a new product coming out called Win Levy um, that just was recently approved by the FDA and it actually targets the um, hormonal component of acne. And it's going to be a topical medication rather than an oral medication. And it probably will have some benefits for hair growth, uh, for, for, um, yeah, androgenic alopecia, we're hopeful for male or female pattern hair loss. So we're both really excited about that. So stay tuned for more information about when levy, um, as it comes out, cause it's really exciting new medication. It is. Oops. Uh, let's see. No, <laughs> do that one. Mm. Well, actually, wait, let me say something about this one real quick. So this one just says tips for unstoppable hair loss in a bald spot from seborrheic dermatitis from 6895. And the only reason I paused on that, and, you know, seborrheic dermatitis generally does not cause hair loss. Definitely it should not be causing scarring. And so this is kind of one of the instances where I think um, it may not be what you think it is. So, you know, if you have hair loss, and especially if it's scarring, please see somebody to make sure that you, they, that you know exactly what's going on so you can treat it and you don't have any permanent problems from it. Yeah, I think you need to figure out what's causing the hair loss here. Sometimes really, really bad sebderm can just plug up the hair so much that you can't grow hair from it, uh, but it doesn't usually cause scarring. So yeah. um, one of those things where it's like, all right, it's really important to get the diagnosis because with hair loss, the hair loss is such a tough topic to talk about um, because there's so many forms of hair loss right. and we actually put them into two broad categories there's either scarring hair loss or non-scarring hair loss. And if you have scarring hair loss, you need to aggressively treat that because once the scarring forms, it actually gets rid of the structures that produce hair. And so you need to act on it pretty quickly. And so I have a saying that like, okay, so in medicine, we have a saying that like time is heart or time is brain, right? Like the yeah, faster yeah, you act sure. on something. So it comes from the idea that um, it's like the American Heart Association um, put together this idea that if you can get somebody that's having a heart attack from the second they have a heart attack to get them to the hospital right away to have an intervention, you could save their life. And so we say time is heart. Same is true for people having strokes. They say time is brain because if you can intervene on a stroke quick enough, you could save somebody's life. So I know this isn't life saving, but I say like time is hair as well, because with hair loss, the quicker you act on it, like if you, if all your hair is gone and then you go see a dermatologist, it's very difficult to get that hair back. But if you yes. act like quick, when you initially start losing hair, you have way more hope at actually getting the hair back. Yeah, it, it really is complicated. It's like non-scarring, scarring. And then scarring is like inflammatory, non-inflammatory, late stage hormonal. Like it, it's just, it's an algorithm and it's a pretty extensive, it's complicated. You guys are asking so many questions and I absolutely love this engagement. It's like off the charts oh, that it's, it's happening so, so fast that I can't even read the <laughs> questions right now. So we're doing our best. We're, we're really doing our best. Oh, one, it's kind of brand specific. What's the question? Oh, it doesn't matter. Is curology no. good? Yeah, we saw that question a few times, like is curology good? And I think it's a fair question. So a couple, it's been probably over two months now, sadly. I did a poll on my Instagram, like basically first, have you used Curology? If you used Curology, how much benefit have you had with it? Um, and then the last question was, what was your formula for, for Curology? And so I have a ton of data that 
I'm hoping to make a YouTube video about to basically tell you guys what I think about Curology. But just to give you a little bit of a preview, because you guys are tuning into our live, I had an opinion about Curology, and my opinion on Curology has not changed based on the data that I have on it. And I and I this is how I feel about Curology. I think that over the counter, you have this. I think if you're if you you know watch a lot of YouTube videos, our YouTube videos, Dr. Dre's YouTube videos, you know one of these um, you know Hiram's YouTube videos, somebody who's going to kind of help you with a good simple acne routine. I think if you follow a good acne routine over the counter, so that means a good cleanser, a good active like different gel, and a good moisturizer, I think you have a really good routine to treat acne, and I think that gets you here. I think if you go to Curology, they have a little bit of stronger options for you that get you here. So I think it is a little bit better than what you can do over the counter. I think seeing a dermatologist in life is like here. And the reason why is because Curology has very limited ingredients that they offer their customers. And I also think that they don't offer like oral medications that could be sometimes very helpful for people. And I also think it's, they also don't see you in, to, in real life to, to make the diagnosis sometimes accurately. So I think that there is a little bit, I think it's beneficial. And I think it has a place. And, and it's I a think, very fair statement. So I think it's, I don't think it's bad. Um, you know, I don't think it's horrible. I think it works for a lot of people. Um, but I think it's slightly above over the counter, but I, I don't think it's exactly like seeing a dermatologist in real life. And Okay, so this is something really important. I've been meaning to introduce this to everybody. And I always talk to you about this. And like, it's something that really guides all of our recommendations. And we always talk about this. What would we tell our family members or people that we love and care about and hold dearest to us when we make recommendations? And that's how I try to make my recommendations to people on social media. So I know some people sometimes get upset if I if I don't agree with something that's happening or I say something doesn't work. But I truly believe like, OK, like if my sister asked me, like, what should I do for my acne? Would I say go do curology or would I say go see a dermatologist? And I think that if she had access to a dermatologist, then go see a dermatologist. But if you don't have access to a dermatologist, then curology would be like the next step down. And so that makes a lot of sense to me. And so in all my recommendations type that I make to you guys and Dr. Maxfield makes to you, we truly believe like, okay, what would we do for the people that we care about most in life? Um, and then we try to make recommendations based on that. So uh, hopefully that doesn't like shatter your thoughts of curology, but that's kind of where I stand. Yeah, it's such a... Uh, no, I completely agree with everything. I mean, think how many times we've talked about the value of having a very accurate diagnosis, deliberate adjustments. Um, and so, you know, some of that may suffer. Um, so I just think there's some, there's a very, very deep inherent value in seeing someone face to face who can walk through this with you. And then again, your skin is going to be respond differently than my skin. Um, so walking through the journey of whatever you're dealing with, with somebody in person is extremely beneficial and valuable. A lot of questions about milia. <clears throat> Could you discuss milia, please? Do you have to take it out with a needle, or can products remove them? Uh, yeah, yeah. So milia. So what are milia? Milia are little cysts under the skin. So a cyst is basically a balloon. There's a there's actually a discrete wall around it, and then inside is something. And in this case, little skin cell type material. Uh, so how are you going to treat that? You usually you're going to have to either. So medically or procedurally, medically you need something that's going to thin the skin. And prevent them from or prevent them from recurring. So thinning the skin, the top layer of the skin may help them be ex more extractable more easily, or preventing them occurring, like a retinoid is going to be helpful. And then procedurally, um, estheticians, doctor, dermatologists, we can manually extract them. Uh, what other things do you like to use other than retinoids? Or is that kind of just a staple? Yeah, I think sort of the principles, like you said, are like really important to understand. Like uh, once the cysts form, I think they're very difficult to like actually get out with skincare products. And, I, and I've tried to like sample this to see if it would work for people. Um, but using like a retinoid or like an um, alpha hydroxy acid yeah, on, a, on a milia that's already formed, I don't really think that they are that effective, um, but I do think they're both very effective at preventing mm -hmm. milia. So I think if you're using an exfoliant once or twice a week, and if you're using a retinoid uh, a couple days a week or every night, I think that you will prevent milia if you're prone to milia. But I think once they form, I do think they need to be extracted by a dermatologist or an esthetician. Um, basically, we just put a little needle in it and then we, we uh, poke them out. We do this all in a clinic like every day. So yeah, it's pretty um, once they form, they're very easy to remove um, at our office um, during your regular checkups. Um, but basically, once they form, I don't think there's much you can do over the counter as far as treatments. Yeah. Um, 
So this one says, been using azelaic acid for one month, no improvement in hyperpigmentation. Please suggest something other than retinol. So retinol will help off the table, probably too irritating. And the reason I picked this is because of the, mostly because of the one month thing. Um, we've talked about it on and off in some of our other videos, but it's kind of like an expectations thing in that hyperpigmentation is something that takes a long time to go away. It's, you know, in my mind, depending on your skin tone, so the darker your skin tone, the longer it might take. Um, I'd, I usually tell people six months, honestly, just to give them an idea of how long it might take. I think three to six is usually fair. Um, but then you can, if you can't use azelaic acid, you have a myriad of other things, uh, such as like vitamin C, niacinamide. There's actually one you all sent me. Uh, I think it's called thiamidol. And uh, let's just call it that, thiamidol. But the, the real name is like this really long ingredient name. And uh, I'll make an Instagram video for this actually, uh, Dr. LJ Maxfield, because this is actually a really newish ingredient. A lot of the studies are newer, um, but the studies are well done. And I'm really excited about seeing where this one will go. But that's an ingredient I'm going to try to start incorporating, try it out personally, and uh, we'll see what happens. Yeah, I'm somebody who's like prone to dark spots after acne bumps. They don't last very long because I, I treat them like right away, like with, by continuing my retinoid, which helps to skip, turn those skin cells over. Uh, but this, I guess, Sadia Khan is saying that her like every, suggests something that's not a retinol, which I think is fair. Yeah. So um, over the counter, I think tranexamic acid is pretty effective mm -hmm. for this. So um, there are a bunch of um, products that have tranexamic acid in it. I think one of the best products is a little bit expensive. Uh, the SkinCeutical Discoloration yeah. Defense, pricey. It's like ninety nine dollars, but is. it has a lot of those ingredients that um, would target this. There's also something. It's called like faded and it might be like 30 bucks um i have to find the exact name of it but i do believe it has tranexamic acid in it and then also the inky list has a pure tranexamic acid night treatment that you can use and i think it's like ten dollars or something like that that's much more affordable so i think tranexamic acid is is very effective for this um i think that alpha arbutin is pretty effective for this i do like azelaic acid and retinoids for this like you mentioned uh, we will do a whole video on hyperpigmentation because there's actually yes, a lot of absolutely. good evidence um, for different ingredients. And uh, I do think that there's a lot of things that you can use that'll be very effective. Hydroquinone is very effective. Very, very, very gold standard. Like I want to, I think it's important to show like, yeah. state it's a very effective ingredient. It has a downside, but it's very effective. Right. So it has downsides. Um, can't use it in pregnancy. Um, it can potentially cause permanent hyperpigmentation. We call that exogenous ochronosis. Yeah, and if you want to see a picture, just doc, Google my name, um, Luke Maxfield, and then Google exogenous ochronosis. If <laughs> that's there, it, I wrote a paper on this. One of my first papers I ever wrote about oh. 10 years ago. Hmm. So there's some pictures in there you can check out. That's interesting. I'll have to read that. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so it's a legitimate concern, but I do think it's very effective if you use it for a short period of time. So if you're using um, hydroquinone for like two or three months, um, it can be very effective to treat hyperpigmentation. After that, you want to transition to something you can use safely long term. So, Absolutely. Um, give, give your azelaic acid more time, like Dr. Max. Yeah. Was and it is thiamidol, and the the product, one of the products that has it is actually Nivea's Luminous three uh, six thirty. Um, so I'm intrigued by it. I, I'm going to check it out personally. The other one is Cispera or uh, Cystiamine. Very <laughs> effective. That's a very good one, effective yeah. for melasma and doesn't have the same uh, long term use problems that. Uh, hydroquinone does. So something worth looking into. I've seen some miraculous results with cysteamine. Yeah. Let's see. And we do, what do you think? This one? Some or something along that lines or yeah. I think okay. that's fair. Yeah, I think that's fair. Probably valuable to a lot of people. Mm-hmm. Uh, the question is from Nav or Nav. How do you get? How do you reduce sebaceous filaments? And then specifically for this one on the chin. Okay. So what is sebaceous filaments? First question number one. So sebaceous filaments are like the little like like uh, like almost they look like blackheads sometimes for some people, but they're basically like that like plugging of your hair follicles that you see of your pores that look clogged. Sometimes they can look black. We call that sebaceous filaments. What it is, is just like a mixture of oil or sebum and um, your skin cells that basically just build up in your pores. And people uh, try to do everything to get rid of these things. You're never gonna get rid of your pores entirely, but you can definitely get rid of that sebaceous buildup inside of your pores. And so my favorite ingredient for this is salicylic acid. Because salicylic acid, 
is lipophilic, means it likes that sebum and it gets in and it helps to clear that out and it also prevents it from building up. It also mildly exfoliates the skin and so it's gonna solve a lot of the problems that are the reason for sebaceous filaments. And so I think this, that it's probably one of the most effective ingredients. Yeah, agreed. And then it's kind of the same list of things that targets some of the oil production in the skin. I think thereafter, the yep. usual suspects, retinol, niacinamide. Um, it, how effective is niacinamide for it? Can't really say. Not really been studied, I don't think, directly, but it, it could, in theory, have benefit. I think that if you're prone to sebaceous filaments, I think it's worthwhile to find a moisturizer with niacinamide in it. Mm -hmm. How much is it going to help? Uh, I don't know. I think that it will help a little bit. And I think that having niacinamide as a moisturizer is going to be beneficial. Yeah, agreed. Okay, so let's talk about niacinamide for just one second. Let's diverge here. I feel like you like niacinamide as much as I like like salicylic acid and I retinol. maybe it's, like I, I like retinol like you like niacinamide. Maybe, maybe, maybe. You have maybe. like a love thing. Like I have for CeraVe, you have for niacinamide. Maybe I do. I don't think I knew this and realized it about myself. But anyway, have you even used niacinamide ever? Yeah, but not. <laughs> but, but, but rarely as a deliberate product. And here's why. Because you can find it in, in a lot of different things. Like LTMD was saying in a lot of her videos. You, you can find this in your moisturizing ingredients. You can find it in your sunscreens. And the question is, is that enough? And we talked about this over a year ago. Like, maybe not that long. We're not going around that long. But it was like one of our first videos. We said that niacinamide was studied at like less than 5%. And so these lower percentage niacinamides are absolutely going to be effective because that's how the studies were done. And the reason, by the way, they picked a 10% for a lot of the formulations, I was just reading on this this week, is in the safety trial, some of the safety data, they studied in five and up to 10%. And 10% was an upper threshold in which it was studied and been shown not to cause irritation. So that's why you have 10% ingredients. Um, but we said a long time ago, 5% is enough, so you can get enough from other ways. Yeah, you can find like niacinamide products up to 20%. I think this phenomenon was happening where people were like, the higher the percentage of something is, the more beneficial it is. So you'd see like vitamin C, like 50% <laughs> vitamin C, and people get really excited about it. But really like vitamin C, you want between eight and 20%. And the same thing yeah. for niacinamide was that I kept finding all these niacinamide products. And then we started reading the studies and we're like, there's not a single study that's showing like that 10% is better than 5% and that all the studies were done with between two and 5% niacinamide. And so we're like, why are we using such high concentrations of niacinamide when you don't need them to have the benefits we're looking for? So just, I, I think your moisturizer that has your 5% niacinamide or your 2% niacinamide in it is going to do pretty well. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. Or you can get my favorite niacinamide dark spot serum from First Aid Beauty, which has 5% niacinamide. Did we get completely off topic? <laughs> I can't even remember the question. Oh, we Did we answer the question? Do we even have a Did topic? Did we answer the question? <laughs> what, was the what was the question? I don't know. It's moved. What I, was the reason? Um, I hope we answered your question. Thoughts on HelioCare. Do you have thoughts on HelioCare? Uh, it's, yeah, in general, I like it. I mean, do you yeah. have any specific considerations for it? Um, you know, I think it's worthwhile looking into it. I, I'm not like big. I, I, I don't like I'm not big on supplements, like personally. I, I agree with you there, though. Like, I, it's just kind of like a downside risk benefit. So, yeah, I don't have a huge qualm with it. Don't know if it's really going to be a huge benefit, though. Yeah, I think that there's a lot of there's like hundreds of studies on helio care, actually. Not maybe not hundreds, but. I think 103 studies. And I like that. <laughs> last time I looked on PubMed. <laughs> oh man, PubMed. I'm just, I'm just joking. So, uh, so last time, I, so there was a good amount of studies on HelioCare <laughs> for um, you know having benefits um, for you know sun protection and for its antioxidant benefits. It may even have some benefit in melasma as well. Yeah. So um, I, I believe the active in it is uh, Polypodium leucomotus. Um, extract and it, it seems to be very effective um, for protecting your skin. It's not going to be a substitute for sunscreen, but it seems to help in addition to sunscreen with melasma, with some of uh, the risk of sunburn and things like that. So I think it's worth looking into. I think if I was going to take a supplement, I think it's one that has good data. I agree. I yeah. agree. So I love this PubMed thing you brought up. So this is like um, where you get peer reviewed. So all these are professionally reviewed research papers. You know how many research papers have been done on skin and uh, apple cider vinegar? Huh? Like zero. <laughs> <laughs> I've been I've been crushing. I've been spending so much time over the last two weeks trying to find studies on vinegar and skin. It, vinegar and skin definitely antibacterial helps antimicrobial, but apple cider vinegar just. And I like apple cider vinegar personally. Like I like the taste. You may see a video coming out on that like actually pretty soon here. But uh, yeah, just no data on the skin. Just so you know. 
Right. I think it's one of those like cure-alls for everything, but there's not a lot of data on it, but people like it. I don't know. Yeah, there's actually one on eczema and it shows that it was not helpful as compared to a normal water wrap for uh, skin. So there was that study. Let's see. There's this uh, Claire Marriott said at home derma rolling, question mark. Oh, Ooh, so someone's yeah. asking about at home derma rolling. Stay tuned for Sunday because oh, yeah. we will be dropping a video about at home derma rolling, amongst other things. So tomorrow we'll drop a video on that. Yeah, so let's see. I was like, I thought we talked about it. Yeah, I was so like, I have so much to say. Yeah, we have, yeah, we have already said it. Wait, we already said that. So uh, go watch that video coming soon. Um, I believe it's already like cut up and ready to go. I just have to make some final edits and then we're good to go, right? You have to make some final edits. Yeah, yeah, that's what I'm saying. I have to make some final <laughs> edits. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. You just uploaded it. Did today. someone say something about jellyfish? And no, I'm just kidding. No one said anything about jellyfish. So jellyfish are back. Uh, ran into quite a few this morning. I surf every Saturday morning. I think before we talked we about this. Dr. Maxfield has like an obsession with tropical medicine, so like things you'll never encounter, love like it. Love like it. caterpillar bites and stuff like that. It's like it's like his thing. It What's is. my thing? What's your your thing is definitely like insects and tropical medicine. Yeah, you throw me in a jungle somewhere, and I'm I'm from Indonesia. I'm not. My mom is from Indonesia, and maybe it's just in, in my blood. But yeah, you throw me in a jungle, and I'll know. Maybe that's what it is. I'll know yeah. something. Um, you'll be able to identify the caterpillar. I'll be able to, yeah. What I'll, will you do about it once you identify I'll it? I'll just say, that's that's that caterpillar. <laughs> <laughs> the procession's caterpillar. Now you can move on. Watch today. out. Watch out. <laughs> <laughs> All right, but what about me? What's my thing? Uh, oh, you. I know. You're, his thing is basic science. His thing is like the random enzymatic ins and outs pathways. Um, and I like pathways, but he likes, what is this molecule doing to this molecule? Like I do like, because I, I think if you understand foundationally how things work, like that somebody can tell you something, like somebody can lie to you and you'll know it's a lie, you know, type of thing. Like if you sort of know like very intrinsically how things work, how things work on the skin, how things are built, how disease processes happen. And then someone tells you this new drug is going to be a miracle cure yeah. for something. And then you're like, no, 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 that's not, it's not going to work because I know how this, so that's why I'm so obsessed with it. Because I think if you understand how things work, then you can understand how to treat them. And then you can also know when new things come out, if they fit into your schema of what you understand about that disease process. So I a hundred percent agree with him, but his is just ridiculous and over the top. He cares about things that no one else gives a rip about. But I guess I do too. Who cares about caterpillars and jellyfish? Yeah. Um, I was going to say, oh, but that's actually one of the misconceptions about doctors in general, I think, though, is I think the majority of our education is actually spent on the physiology, anatomy, and then how that works out in the real world. Um, that's the bulk of our education is how does the body work from the cellular level all the way through it as a complete system. And I think that's just in general why we and other people are very critical of things as they come out, because we're just referencing that with everything else that we know uh, about the body. Uh, yeah. Something related to the, the German rollers. Grace Case says, but I saw Dr. Shaw buy all these rollers at TJ Maxx. <laughs> So yeah, someone's saying she saw Dr. Shaw by all these uh, derma rollers at TJ Maxx. There's a couple of people that like, so sometimes people, so I don't know if you guys know, so I, I'm like very active on TikTok, Instagram, and I make all these videos where I walk into stores and I pick out skincare products and skincare devices and either I roast them um, or I say that these are really good and you should go buy them. But oftentimes I don't buy anything. I just like leave and walk out. <laughs> but a lot of people like in our stores locally, like recognize me. So it's always like awkward when I walk in and they're like, oh, you're going to film some videos and leave. And I'm like, yep. <laughs> I certainly am. But anyway, so the people at TJ Maxx saw me. But um, I, yeah, no, Derma Rollers is going to like be a thumbs down for me. But you guys will see how I feel about them. Um, mm -hmm. Someone said, oh, so Priyanshi Tripathi said, can you use retinol in your 20s? Yeah, that's a hard yes. Yeah, it, it all just goes back to what, so retinol and retinoids treat a myriad of things. They treat a lot of different things. And so it depends what you're treating. Some people have acne in their 20s. So you, you can use it in your 20s. You can use it in your late childhood. If you're treating your, if you want to treat it for like anti-aging, like collagen growth, dispigmentation, absolutely start it in your 20s. I think that would be a very appropriate time to use that, start that. You just slow the aging process. I remember someone got, I think they were kind of upset. They're like, stop saying anti-aging. You can't stop aging. I know you can't stop aging, but like the goal is just to slow it down, you know? Same with me and dispigmentation. I'm going to get dispigmentation because I love being outside, but I still want to slow it down. 
Yeah, that's that's a good question. Like about aging, like I think that there's like two schools of thought. Like you know, I think some people like do everything to stop aging, but I think that you should just be healthy. Like I'm I'm really into like skin health overall, so that's why I'm like so big into sunscreen because like it protects you from skin cancer. It also protects you from aging. But I think just like anything else, like it should be focusing on the health of the thing, not necessarily like the beauty of the thing. I don't know if that makes sense. Like like it's almost like. I think a lot of people with anti-aging processes, like with Botox filler, um, try to change the way that they look. And I'm, I'm of the thought, even with these things, that we should be replacing what is lost with age so that you can age sort of gracefully and look natural in the process of aging. But there, there are schools of thoughts on this. I think some people yeah, feel differently fair. and they want a different look. And I, I just kind of, I, I don't know if you feel the same way, but I think you do. I right? do. Like, yeah, I'm very much, I'm very much in the same way. I always prefer. I think everyone like has like a very unique value and a very unique, like, I think the unique look is actually a very nice thing. It's you, you know? And I get that people want to preserve that because you've been looking at yourself and you just want to look like a version of you that, um, that you're used to seeing. And I think that's totally fair. Well, I'm very passionate about hair loss personally, you know, like I'm trying to do whatever I can to prevent hair loss for myself. Yeah, so. we both really are. So we yeah, I, I totally <laughs> understand that. I understand the, the thought, like, you know, you want to delay the aging process and you know, I'm all, that's what we're here for. Yeah. <laughs> There was a really good question and I can't find the question anymore. But the question was like, how do you find, or how do you know if someone's a good dermatologist? Oh. And, and I, like, I find that to be like a fascinating question because I don't know that you can know as a person, it's right? very like, difficult. As, as, like, as like a consumer that's walking into a dermatology office, oftentimes your insurance is gonna tell you where you should go. Um, it's going to be based on like availability. I think you can look at people's credentials. I think you want to look for a board certified dermatologist that's board certified by the American Academy of Dermatology or the American Board of Dermatology. Beyond that, you know, I think that there's going to be a certain level of knowledge and competence that comes with those things. Um, but I truly believe, and I think this is true of all doctors, that it doesn't matter. Like it only, the only thing that matters is how much they care. Yeah. Like hundred percent. And you'll know based on how they treat you, how they talk to you, how they talk to their staff and everything. And almost times you won't know until you see them, but yeah, that's it, true. it's the idea that they care enough to like follow up. They're worried about you. They want to make sure that you're getting what you need. They're making sure that the medications are affordable. Um, they're not just like rushing you in and out. Um, I think that one of the best things that you can do is ask like one of your peers or somebody you care about, like that has, like, I think word of mouth is so important. Mm -hmm. It's true. Um, I think you can look at credentials, but I don't, in my experience, I don't think it really goes as far as that, like human touch. It's true because, you know, I think the amount of education that all board certified dermatologists go through provides them with a huge foundational knowledge base. Uh, and then it's just, how are they going to apply it to you? And that's just how much are they invested in you? But there are going to be some differences. Like there are some people are more invested in uh, certain things and others. And so you'll have conversations with your doctor and dermatologist and you'll just find that you're not on the same page and that's okay. Like your goals may not be aligned. And uh, so you, you may have to just kind of feel that out. I have to go soon though, because I gotta head out. Oh, a wedding. Oh, he's that got was, a wedding. He's got to go to. Um, let's. Say, by the way, who has that question? Oh, so Hunter said, "Been using your tips for starting a retinoid. Did my first month using different every three days, and nice. now I'm starting to use it every other day. Thank you so much." So we gave a tip um, in our retinol video that said, "Start." every third day for a month and then every set every two days for a month every other day for a month and then every day for the third month and there's like a rule that we made up on the fly that day <laughs> but I, like hunter like I, I that that's we love feedback you know we love feedback we love hearing that you guys are implementing things and that they're working for you um i do a, a thing on clubhouse every like it used to be every saturday it was me every sunday now but I, I like i love when people get on stage or like on these lives or in the comments and they say i did this thing i implemented this thing and it worked or it didn't work we love feedback you know it helps kind of guide us and gives us more information to act on going forward so thank you yeah it really does um you know, and even like we'd say this at all, probably the end of all our videos now, though, you know, we get comments from all the videos, you know, we're throughout the whole week, probably we're both, I think, scrolling comments and we may not respond to all of them just because, you know, we are working, but we really want to do as much as we can. But, you know, I've learned a lot from you all. I've looked into new ingredients. Um, it's changed the way I'm probably going to practice sometimes. Like I'm obsessed with some of the over the counter azelaic acids only because they're affordable, you know, so it's changing how I practice. And I think uh, that's something you all really brought to the table and helped help yeah. me with. Like I, I feel like over the last, I've been on social media now for almost a year, 
And like, I've learned, it's been like a learning process together with all of you. Like I've learned so much from all of you. Um, I've grown a lot. Like, I, I think we like, this is such like a, like a learning experience together. And like, sometimes we're going to be wrong. And I think yeah. that that's important to know, like great point, new though. data will come out or we may misspeak or something like that. But like, we're really like trying to put out so, as much good information as we can, but we'll learn from you. You'll learn from us. I think that like, we'll grow together just like the channel's growing. And like, I know like Dr. <laughs> Maxfield's got to go, but like, you know, it's uh, like, this is like, you know, like I said, like this is for like everybody that helped us get here. So, you know, thank you guys for this. Um, hopefully you guys found the live helpful. And um, if you like it, we'll, I guess, do more stuff like this. Yeah, we'll try to do it again. We, I think it's good. And this has been like an awesome experience for us, the channel. So, you know, we're very grateful for all of you and hopefully um, we continue to grow together. Yeah, we'd greatly appreciate you all. Like comment, subscribe. <laughs> I feel, we get into these rhythms where like we just start phasing out, and then I just go into the routine of what we say normally. <laughs> yeah, here we go. <laughs> here, here we go. All right, see you guys next time. All right, see y'all.